Well, good afternoon. My name is Al Roberts, and I have the pleasure of uh, chairing uh, our first session of the afternoon. Uh, I'm the co-editor of the journal Governance, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to participate in today's event. It would be totally inappropriate for me to do a plug for the journal Governance at this moment, so I will not tell you that if you go to uh, governancejournal.net, you can uh, among other things, to see a photo of this morning's event and see if you can identify yourself. But more importantly, uh, you can sign up for the email newsletter for governance, uh, which gives you access to uh, many of our articles, but also some of the commentary from other academics on the material that is in the journal. Uh, we have had the pleasure of uh, publishing uh, works that Marilee Grindle was publish um, discussing this morning. Also, the very interesting commentary that uh, Francis Fukuyama did for us last spring. You'll find that article and also many comments on that piece. And in fact, we just published a book review uh, by Michael Wolcock um, uh, just a few weeks ago, which is very interesting as well. It's got one of my favorite lines ever from a book review. It, start, it says, uh, I wanted to love this book and ended up merely liking it. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, the theme of our session this afternoon is uh, New Practice in Action, and we're fortunate to have uh, three uh, people who are going to talk to that subject. Uh, I'll give you a very brief description and let the festivities begin. Our first speaker <coughs> will be Peter Harrington, who is a Fulbright Scholar who is visiting here at Harvard University. Uh, he's from the UK and worked for the think tank uh, Demos and then became, uh, uh, joined the Tony Blair Africa Governance Initiative and working in Liberia before coming to uh, Harvard. Our uh, second guest is uh, Jennifer Widener, and Jennifer is Professor of Politics and International Affairs and also Director of the Bobst Center for Peace and Justice uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. And our third uh, speaker, is Nadim Mata, and Nadim is president and founding board member of the Rapid Results Institute, and he has worked in many countries and will be drawing on that experience for his presentation today. So each of our speakers, the instructions are that they will have 20 minutes to, to uh, talk, and then after we've heard the three presentations, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Uh, I'll, I'll flag uh, the, the time for our three speakers. I'm Canadian, and so if any of our speakers are running over time, I will impose the most severe sanction a Canadian can think of. Uh, I will look at each of them with a look of real disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to you. It's not the anger, it's a disappointment that gets you. Um, thank you very much, Alistair, and first of all, thanks very much to you. <coughs> Uh, the Kennedy School in particular, Matt Andrews, for uh, arranging this event, which is fantastic, and also for inviting AGI and myself to speak on behalf of AGI, um, and all the people who are involved in, in organizing it. Um, I want to start with sort of two disclaimers. The first is that uh, I've never presented the, uh, this Liberia case study before, and in fact, AGI has never presented it before, so it's the first time, first run, um, you're my guinea pigs, I will try and keep to time, in fact, I'm going to take my watch off. And uh, that's the first one. The second disclaimer is that um, the views expressed in this presentation do not necessarily represent those of AGI, but I'm not going to tell you which ones do and which ones don't, so I'm not to guess. Um, and any typos, mistakes in the presentation are also their fault. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll get moving. Uh, as Alistair said, I was a, actually deputy country head uh, in Liberia for AGI. Um, I, will, I will talk a little bit about AGI because I think some of the people in this room will know AGI and many of you won't. So I'll talk briefly about AGI and, uh, and what we do. I'm conscious that, uh, you know, I'll try and go through that quite quickly because I'm conscious that I'm preaching to the choir a little bit in terms of our approach. Um, but it might throw up some interesting points for discussion uh, after the initial presentations. Um, and then I'll talk about this, uh, this case study that we recently published uh, about a project that we did, a, a sort of um, initiative that we took within our Liberia project, which was to help the government prepare an action plan, a sort of, hundred, you know, 150 day, rather 100 day plan, um, beginning the second term of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's um, presidency. So, so the, uh, 
I was there for about three years, living and working in Monrovia, sort of nine to five within within the institutions of Liberian government, more like sort of eight to eight, uh, actually. But um, uh, this is this is a very important part of our model: is that our people live and work in country. So a, a little bit about AGI, what we do and where. Um, we're in seven countries. Um, the first was Rwanda, AGI started in about 2008. Um, and Liberia was actually the third project. So we arrived in uh, early 2010. And so that's that's a sort of you know one bookend for for the you know for the story that I'm going to try and tell you today. Um, AGI is sort of based on three I suppose three core principles. One is that um, enormously positive change you know is possible in Africa, um, which you know is, is I think increasingly you know uh, agreed on, but was, this wasn't always the case. Um, I think that the second one is that governance is, 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 uh, is critical to that change. Um, and I think, again, I'm preaching to the choir there. And I think the third thing, which, which is a theme I'll come back to, is the importance of sort of where political authority and political power lies um, is very important to, uh, is a very important aspect uh, of governance. So those are sort of three animating ideas. Um, in the, the Liberia project, there was a, a team of five of us all based in the presidency for the first two years. And then in a sort of phase two of the project, we moved out of the hub into some sort of spoke, some, some particular uh, line ministries. Um, this is about as concise a summary as I can find of what AGI does. AGI provides practical advice and support to help Africa's leading reformers bridge the gap between their vision and the capacity of their government to achieve it. So let's talk about that gap a little bit. A sort of part of AGI's kind of diagnosis is there is a gap, and this is one of the most important aspects of improving governance and improving delivery in Africa, um, in the developing world, there's a gap between vision and implementation. So, uh, you know, a president comes into power, there's a great quote from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf actually, that you arrive in power and you have all, you know, this incredibly expectant public, um, but you lack the machinery of government to actually, to actually meet those expectations and make things happen. And so there is a kind of race going on between the expectations of the public for, for implementation and um, and, uh, and the ability of government to actually deliver. And so this is very much all about implementation. It goes back to a point that Francis Fukuyama made this morning. I think we, we, you know, we believe very strongly that that's the problem. It's not always really knowing what the right policy is. That actually isn't necessarily that difficult. You should build a power station. That's quite straightforward. I mean, it, can, it can get more complicated, but sometimes it's not that complicated. The hard bit is actually doing it, actually making it happen. So that's the problem that we're trying to, that we're trying to address. This is the kind of nicely alliterative Three P's and three S's, very convenient, they all started with the same letter. Um, but that's the sort of deliverology that AGI um, brings to its work. And you know, we embed advisors um, within different units and different parts of government to sort of try and strengthen these muscles. If these things are muscles, we're trying to kind of strengthen those muscles. So um, just to sort of wrap up about AGI's approach, um, these are the sort of six important elements. And I just want to say a word about each. Um, so centre of government, let's start up there on the sort of top right. Centre of government, as I mentioned, we typically start in the hub and then add to that, add some spokes to that after sort of first, you know, after a couple of years. Um, we think that the centre of government is really important to this, to, you know, this issue of bridging this gap and to, and to implementation. Um, it's an important locus of political authority. It's, uh, it, it that plays an important coordinating role and unblocking role. Um, and actually there's isn't really all that much support available to the very centre of government. Um, so this kind of, it's hard to read, really, but this shoulder to shoulder thing, leader to leader is really about a relationship that Tony Blair can have with his sort of, you know, with the presidents and, and you know, that, that is a part of the model and, a, and a, a very important part. But the bit I want to focus on is this kind of shoulder to shoulder aspect, which means embedded advisors, you know, you're living and working in the office day to day, building relationships, working alongside your counterparts. Um, uh, government-led in the middle there, I think obviously a really important part of what we do is this idea that our work has to be government-led, we only enter a country if it's by invitation, um, and the diagnosis of the problem and the, and the sort of uh, the ideas for ha what they want to change within their unit or department, what things they think that they need to make more efficient is a conversation. It's a constant dialogue, and it's a conversation that you have. We don't come in and say this is the problem. We sit down and say, okay, what do you, how do you guys perceive this problem? Um, talk about it. Suggest some 
ideas or some different takes on that, and then co-create a, you know, a solution. And so that's, that's a very important part of it. Um, focus on outcomes, and this was interesting, you know, when I was, when I was listening to Francis Fukuyama's um, remarks this morning, this is, to us is very important. It's not capacity building for capacity building's sake. The point is to get stuff done. Um, and I think the overriding philosophy that we have is that uh, capacity building is about, is about doing, and you learn by doing, and the only kind of doing that really matters is delivering the things that government is supposed to deliver. So um, that's a very important piece. And then, the, and then obviously, flexibility uh, is, is, uh, is, you know, the adaptive part. I think we'll, we're probably going to come back to that a lot. And then finally, getting the politics of the form. This is a really important part of what we do and something I will return to regularly. But um, understanding the political landscape and the interests, incentives, and motivations of the different actors, small p and big p politics. And that's something I'll come, I'll come back to and talk about in a moment. Both the politics within the institutions and the individuals involved, but also you know, the political landscape in the country, the electoral um, landscape, and uh, th those sort of broader national level forces. So that's AGI. I tried to canter through that relatively quickly, keep an eye on how I'm doing on time. Uh, I don't want to get the look. Um, so let's go. OK. So the 150 day plan. We, we recently published a case study uh, about what we did. It's the first case study that uh, AGI has published. And we wanted to sort of take an example of something we did and, um, and try and draw some lessons and insights from it. Uh, you know, as I say, I was there throughout the, well, we drew down for a few months to avoid kind of political, uh, the perception that we could be involved in any political sorts of processes. So, we, so we, we withdrew our project during the campaign period and then returned immediately after the, um, immediately after the election. So I was part of that team throughout that transition. And then there's a sort of, it's very much like the United States. There's an election, it's finished in November, and then you've got this kind of like no man's land until January. As I already mentioned, we'd been there in mid-2010. Liberia's election was in the fall of 2011. This is some sort of background context. And I think an important piece of background context of this is that there was really a need for a step change in, in, in the delivery uh, of, of, of the Sirleaf government in her second term. It was very likely she was going to win, not guaranteed, but very likely. Um, and a lot had been achieved. I mean, I think we, it's a different conversation to talk about the first term or Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's record. I, I, I sort of have, you know, thoughts about that, which, which I won't go into here because it's too long, but there tends to be sort of very sort of polarized opinions about it. Um, but there was certainly a need for, to improve the government's ability to actually deliver things. Um, so let's have a look at a little bit, uh, just a sort of overview of what happened. You could say that the, the problem was, in a sense, how do you galvanize a government which is, which is under-delivering? Um, it's a little bit unsure of its trajectory and its mandate because of the election, as I'll come to in a moment, um, to respond to a sort of skeptical uh, electorate, which it very much was over the course of this election. Uh, articulate a vision very clearly and then hit the ground running in a second term. That was kind of, that was the sort of, how do we do that? Um, so we were looking, you know, we, we, we were thinking in terms of an action plan that would generate momentum um, in the present second term. In practice, the, the, the plan as it finally sort of manifested was really just a list of deliverables. It wasn't a sort of uh, more sophisticated than that. It was 85 deliverables that were group, uh, deliverables that were grouped under five pillars. And um, uh, it was implemented by a big coalition. In fact, there were a lot of people involved in this, and that's something I'll return to in the sort of lessons and insights. Um, and by the end, it had achieved 74% of, of these deliverables. Um, road renovation, 250 miles of feeder roads, vocational training scheme for about 3,000 young people, um, a trust fund to kickstart the renovation of a hydroelectric dam, which was one of the big issues of, you know, delivery issues of that first term. So that's a bit of that's a bit of, of uh, that's a sort of overview. Let's take a look at what happened. Um, just to sort of tell the story, and, and as I go through this, I'll, I'll give you you know a bit more context and a bit and, a, and talk about what our role was uh, as we go through. So there was a um, we, we sort of break it down to three phases. Now you know when we talk about this and, and what we did. Phase one was sort of pre-election. Phase two was this transition, and phase three was the implementation phase. That the actual 150 days. Um, so, I think a really important part of when we tell this story is to say that this wasn't about election happens and then we quickly have a conversation scramble and, and do this thing. These conversations started 
seven, eight months before this transition period, you know, b before the election happened in October, November, or before the election, uh, election was concluded. Um, we'd been, and we'd also been in the, in the um, Ministry of State for a year before those conversations even started, and that's an important point. Um, we, we began a kind of dialogue with the, you know, we had fairly regular meetings. We started to raise questions and start to try and just nudge at the start of the conversation about, are you thinking about your second term? Are you thinking about what your priorities are going to be? What's your agenda going to be? Um, we'd already obviously talked a lot about problems that we saw in delivery, you know, blockages, issues within, within, within the Ministry of State, which was her, you know, her sort of White House. Um, we raised this idea of a 100-day plan. Um, and there was also a meeting in London between the President and Tony Blair where we, 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 we had a quite interesting in-depth conversation about, about the second term sort of legacy and her priorities. Um, our basic point was you need to plan. You need to start thinking about this now. Um, and, you know, not assuming that you're going to win, but really start thinking about this early. Um, so then this sort of led into the election. Obviously, we'd withdrawn from about August. Uh, first round of the election was on 11th of October. Um, it was highly contested. It, wasn't, it had to go to a runoff because she didn't win outright. The opposition made some allegations of, of fraud all over the Carter Centre. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, and you know, the Carter Centre sort of gave it a stamp of approval, but it was tense and quite fraught. And the runoff was due on the 8th of November. On the 7th of November, the opposition, uh, well, a week before the 8th of November, the opposition announced that they would boycott the second round. They said, oh, this is, we don't like this, we, we, you know, we're going to boycott the second round. I mean, depends who you are. Some people say, well, it's because there were genuine concerns. Others will say, well, they knew they were going to lose. Um, and there are all sorts of you know, stories like, you know, about the kinds of things they were asking for behind the scenes. Um, but there was, a there was a nasty clash on the 7th of November between opposition partisans and the police, and two people died. And this, this really became, this became the story about the election. And there was a lot of international media in the country. Um, and it started to sort of, you know, the story started to be elections marred by violence. You know, this was a month after the president had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And so this is a very, very important establishing context for, 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 you know, for the work that ensued in these subsequent phases. Um, and so, you know, runoff happened, the president wins, but turnout is extremely low. And so, her, you know, there, there was a genuine crisis of, or, you know, an issue about legitimacy, about the credibility. You know, she won a, a, a you know, runoff with 92% of the vote, but on a, on a sort of 25% turnout, something like that. Very, very low. And so the fallout, moving into that sort of second phase, the fallout was a very important part of this. She was being criticised in, in the international media, um, and it was clear, I think more than international criticism, it was more that the... It, the election had really kind of unearthed this kind of underbelly of a very angry constituency who felt that they know that a lot of things are changing in the, in the last five years, but it's, none of it's affected me. I'm not on the bus. And I think this was a real wake-up call um, to people in government, particularly in the presidency. This needed to be, to be responded to, and you started to see the message evolving, talking about reconciliation and talking about inclusion. So the beginnings of a sort of some seeds of a, of a sort of narrative and agenda for the second term. Um, and so I think the, the, that issue came to the top. And because of some of these moves, these sort of changes in, in, you know, in, in the country, uh, the this idea of 150 day plan, you know, we kind of re-suggested it. And about late November, we said, OK, well, you really need to start in planning now. We need to tackle this legitimacy issue, but you really need to start planning ahead, because that's ultimately the most powerful way to respond to these issues. Um, so uh, suddenly there was a lot more uh, enthusiasm or sort of receptiveness to this idea because this sort of big P backdrop had, had, had changed. Um, and also they, they just hadn't thought about what to do in the second term. I mean, it was, I mean she was busy sort of you know, going to Norway to give her Nobel acceptance speech and it really, there really wasn't much happening. Um, but, but then, you know, as I say, it, it did gain momentum. We, we had some conversations, some sort of important conversations with the, Ministry, with the Minister of Finance and with the President, well, the uh, not yet made Minister of Finance, but a very important aide of hers. And um, things started to gain momentum. They were enthusiastic, they said, yes, we want to do this. So we helped them frame a, a, uh, a 
design process and implementation process. And this is really the turning point where it went from us sort of nagging them being, what about 150 day plan to, this is something we want to do, we're gonna pick up this ball and run with it. It was a really important turning point. Um, despite, uh, you know, despite sort of, you know, the pressures and the worries about, you know, what was going on uh, in the country and also the fact that no one knew what their job would be when the, when the, when the president, after the president was inaugurated. Um, so, just design-wise, what you know, what ensued was a small task force. Um, she wrote letters uh, to particular individuals in government. These are very important because it meant people got a letter from the president. It's like I've actually got to do this. Um, and there was a couple of two, about two intensive weeks of writing, you know, coming up with ideas, these lists of deliverables, phoning up on mobile phones with your scratch cards, phoning up the guy from Youth and Sports and Being and saying, well, that thing that you're going to do, that vocation, youth vocational training, can you do it by June of next year? And he's like, well, yeah, I think so. Okay, great. It's going, it's going on a day plan. Um, and, you know, uh, more like that. Okay, I better speed up. Um, essentially then, uh, and we also designed an implementation process with a task force and a steering committee. Um, Basically, then nothing happened because they were busy writing the inauguration speech and the annual message, which is a you know both in January, both happened in January. The idea that we pushed was that the 150 day plan, the inauguration speech, would sort of create some mood music. 150 day plan would sort of substantiate that with some actual actions. First of February comes around, nominal start, nothing happens. It just sort of disappeared. It just sort of went down a rabbit hole for three weeks, and then about three weeks later. It just kind of appeared again. We, we sort of asked him, "What's happened to this plan? It's all written. It's ready to go." And then it just and then they're just right. Okay, we're ready to do this. And I will never know what conversations were happening during those three weeks. We can speculate, but but it, it, it resurfaced. Okay, right, we're ready to go. We'll pull the trigger. The president got her whole cabinet behind her at a press conference and said, "This is our 50-day plan. We published it and it had a nice kind of first-page mission statement that was very tied into what she said in the annual message and the inauguration speech." And she said. Anyone who doesn't implement these deliverables, sort of it's going to be a serious performance issue, which was great. Uh, moved into an implementation phase, and uh, you know, sort of trying to get through this fairly quickly. Um, very little happened for about three months. Again, there's every, there was confusion about who was responsible for what. Rupert, my colleague, who Matt knows well, he was the country head, was in the ministry, so just trying to get these steering committee meetings to happen, almost impossible. Um, and then on the 3rd of May, something really interesting happened. The Liberian Media Center, a civil society sort of watchdog, published a report. They created a website called the Government's 150-Day Plan Implementation Tracker. And it was, had a little dial, sort of like a speedometer, and they were showing where it was. And they published a report basically saying 2.4% 2, 2 of these deliverables have been achieved so far, with only about another 20% on track. And this was a massive sort of, they basically lit a fire under the government. Suddenly the president said, oh, what, hold on, sort of, you know, you know, focus, sort of, you know, return to this issue. She's calling up the finance minister saying, what on earth is going on? Steering committee meets. Um, and then there's a meeting between um, the Liberian Media Center and the, and, and the government and the to say, well, look, this is, you know, this is the, you know, the data that we've had and we've collected on how much you've actually delivered. And they shared a lot of information. It was really the first meeting of its kind where civil society and government got into a room and really shared information. Um, and another very important part was, was sort of the, the, uh, the uh, involvement of the government's communications team who were constantly asking for, well, we haven't got anything to say. We, you know, we're doing these press releases, sorry, these press conferences. We, we haven't really got anything to report because we're not getting any information. So the president's office got involved. And then from 3rd of May, which was basically with about over halfway gone, you saw a dramatic ink from 2.4% to 74% completed. So in the last couple of minutes, I'll, I'll, jump to, um, I'll jump to some, let me just get through these, I'll highlight these for you. Um, some lessons learned, some insights, and I'll try and go through these fairly quickly. Uh, these are the sort of lessons that we've tried to, uh, to, to, to draw out. So some lessons for government. Um, I think for us, it's about building a coalition. There's, um, there are a lot of people involved in this, the President's office, the Finance Ministry, um, the President's Delivery Unit, the Government Communications Team, and the, and the, and the agencies themselves. It's, they're very, very, you know, this coordinating coalition was really important because these things couldn't have happened if they weren't, if, if they weren't all involved. Um, choose the right goal. So this, was a, this is to do with positives and negatives. 74% is good, but not 100%. 
and a lot of the goals were unrealistic. They, you know, they probably weren't feasible in, in that time frame. Interestingly, quite a lot of them were sort of intangible, like write a, a plan or produce a policy paper. Interestingly, the, the, the tangible goals a far greater proportion of the tangible goals got achieved than the intangible, supposedly easy ones, the sort of filler that the guys wanted to put in um, to sort of make it easy. It was really interesting, totally unexpected. Um, and less is more. I think 85 was probably too many. Uh, open yourself up to pressure. This is the point about the role of the, of the LMC. It was a really interesting um, degree to which this outside watchdog role, as I say, lit a fire under the government's performance and suddenly accelerated what they were doing, and you know, hairs were running in you know, in every different direction. Um, so the LNC takes an enormous amount of credit for that, but also the government, you know, to, to its credit as well, has created a an environment where organisations like that can operate and exist, and and actually have that have that dialogue. And then for partners, um, for partners, adapt as you go. Okay, Matt's going to love this. Um, but this was very important. Our role changed throughout those three phases. We were a sort of provocateur back in phase one. Um, and then in phase two, in the transition, we became a sort of facilitator, helping suggest some ideas for the process. And then really in phase three, we would, we, we, by then we, we would step back and we were just a supporter and try to kind of nudge where possible, do it you know, a bit more like sort of acupuncture, um, and just kind of press in some particular places. Um, so the the... And this goes back to the point that change is, it's not, you know, change of this type is not linear. It goes in fits and starts, and you have to adapt your role depending on what, on what kind of intervention or what kind of nudge is needed. Um, the fifth message, navigate the political context. And so I've, I've, I've spoke, spoken a bit about this on the big, on the, on, you know, on the, on the sort of macro, on the big P backdrop, um, taking, spotting the, the change, the way the landscape had changed after the election, and how there might be a lot more enthusiasm for um, a 150 day plan at this point. And then on the small p, understanding who those kind of in crucial, who those important players are to get involved in this and behind it to get, help the idea kind of achieve escape velocity. Because otherwise it just sort of almost gets ended and comes back down to earth. Um, <coughs> I think one other point that I'd like to make is about this point about the right to play. It's really important. This isn't in the AGI write up of the case, this is me. Now, so I promise I said I wasn't going to tell you the difference, but, but I am. Um, I think it's really important to remember that we've been working day to day side by side with these people for 18 months, well, almost two years by this time. And during that process, you take you, you build up relationships, you build up a lot of trust. And so, if we'd swooped in in the tra in the tra you know just immediate aftermath of the election, we didn't have all these relationships. And said, hey, why don't you do a 150 day plan? It's possible that they would have done it, but. In my view, by no means certain, the, power, the strength of those relationships was really important. Mm -hmm. The trust that was there to allow us to play a facilitating role, um, but ultimately hand it over to them and not and not be the drivers of it, because that was really that was really why this case study stood out for the Iberia project. Is this is one instance where the government really took an idea and ran with it, and then the sort of cross-cutting thing is communications. Now I'm biased because I led the communications work stream, but in several ways the. The um, communications are really important. In the design phase, the, the communications were crucial because the, the president needed to respond to a political crisis. And it was all about making the 150 day plan consistent and aligned with a vision and a, and a, and a, you know, a narrative that she needed to produce to respond to that crisis, which is why the, which is why the, um, the speech, making this aligned with her sort of inauguration speeches was so important. And that relates back to the political issue. And then the last point on the, um, on the implementation phase, Rupert, my colleague, came up with this wonderful phrase, which is the communications tail wagged the delivery dog, um, which is like such a mouthful, but I think it's great. Because, because again, um, the government needed to show it was progressing on the 150-day plan. It created a sort of external public expectation around it. The government's communications team was talking about it from week to week. And it meant that you needed to actually follow through and deliver, and the LMC, example is, uh, is, is a point to that. There are lots of limitations too, which I will not talk about now. I will save for discussion. I'll leave it there. I hope I'm not too far over, Alistair. Thank you very much and look forward to speaking to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I'll turn it over to uh, Jennifer. So I'm going to thank Matt for uh, 
giving us the occasion to come together because I think too often the people who are thinking along these lines don't get a chance to see one another in person. So thank you for writing the book. Um, so there are public servants everywhere. We're, we're, oh, do I need to click? No, I need no, to. Which one, which one is it? I'm sorry. It's, it's ISS. this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would do the same thing. <laughs> I'm a lot of angry. Okay, great. And I have to learn how to click this. Um, there, there are public servants everywhere around the globe who have actually succeeded in making governments work in very hard places. And uh, about five years ago, I put together a group at Princeton to try to think, well, what could we learn from these very noble souls? And they often are facing threats to their own lives. Uh, where their families are experiencing threats. So what can we learn from them? They've, they've achieved great things. Uh, and we it's a tiny part of that agenda that I want to talk about today, if I can learn how to, where am I putting this? There we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the project, because it's the source of the data that I'm going to use today, uh, and its relationship to the reformers' calculus. Uh, I'm going to focus on one tiny element of this project. I'm going to talk about a, a sort of simple example of how a number of reformers have produced very rapid transformations within single agencies, uh, and talk about some generalizations. Not a strong word this morning, but uh, I think you can generalize to some degree. Uh, we're going to crack the code. And then look at the influence of context. And I'll just hint at this, because it's a much longer conversation, but the kinds of workarounds that reformers have have, uh, have found. It gets to um, a click guard's question, will this work here? That's the title of your new book, is that it? What will yeah. work here? What will work here? Um, it, it tries to get at that, at that kind of question. Uh, so let me just say a few words about the, the data source uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's from a program called Innovations for Successful Societies, uh, and we have gone out and tried to essentially chronicle the work of public servants in different parts of the world. Uh, we, we try to track what they did, uh, we capture their reflections about it, and uh, we help them share these with other reformers. And the hope is not only that it reduces the information search costs of those reformers, but it also helps us as policymakers or academics think in a much uh, grittier fashion about the process of institutional change and implementation. Uh, these are distinctive case studies, as some of you know, because I met a bunch of people who have read a lot of them. They are clustered around uh, the challenges that reformers tell us they face. Now, on the website where all these are hosted, they're organized thematically. But behind that is a structure of, right now, about eight questions that reformers told us were real sticking points, and we dug in on those. We have to find a better way so you can access the cases in that way as well. Uh, they are reformer-focused, so the reformers in the driver's seat, a little bit like a Harvard Business School case, uh, and they are operationally detailed. A little uneven there. The early ones are a little less detailed than some of the later ones. Uh, and they do, I think, facilitate uh, the sharing, but they also give us some grist, I think, for generalization. And you can visit the website if you want to read any of these. They are um, open source in the sense that you can use them for and duplicate them for non-commercial purposes. Uh, and many governments have, have been doing that as part of their uh, own internal training lately. Um, so I'm going to talk about one part of the reformers' calculus, or one response to one part of the reformers' calculus. We go out there and we talk to uh, important reformers around the globe. One of the things that they will all tell you is there's a big time inconsistency problem in reform. That is, you need to take some hard steps now in order to realize benefits that will only come quite a ways down the road. And if you're working in a context where there have been a lot of broken promises in the past, or people are very distrustful of one another, how do you get people to give you that space to implement and to get this job done, to deliver stuff? Um, and, and so one of the problems I wrestled with is this time inconsistency problem. This is Idris Jala in Malaysia, who many of you probably know. And his adage is, big results fast. You've got to deliver something that really shocks people. It says to them, oh, government can't actually do something. 
Uh, and he's been trying that in, in Malaysia in a number of ways, very complex uh, system. Uh, but essentially what he and others, I think, have done is to figure out that there are some services that ordinary citizens and businesses value greatly uh, that you could actually make inroads into pretty, pretty fast. You could, you could improve them pretty rapidly. They are pretty simple take my academic hat, principal agent problems. That is, uh, they're, they're the kinds of managerial problems you run into in government or in any organization firm around the world. Uh, and it's just the, in these very tough environments, the kinds of stock solutions we have to those are generally not available. So you have to find more interesting ways to get at these problems. Uh, and you could call these pockets of effectiveness. They're particular kinds of pockets of effectiveness. We just dub them single agency transformations, although that's a bit of a misnomer in some ways. So I want to give a story about one of these and then, then talk about the way we've been generalizing from um, some of the case studies we've, we've done. Uh, and the, the story, very briefly, and I'm going to leave out a lot of the interesting detail here, uh, is set in Malaysia. Uh, and the problem here is that you had uh, poorly performing land registries at a time when the economy was growing. Uh, there was a big demand for the ability to buy and sell land. Uh, the delays uh, were, were quite extensive. So in 80% of the cases in the area I'm going to talk about, the delay was over a year to get a land title. Now, if you're engaged in a land transaction, the, the prices could change dramatically in a year. Too, so, so the values would be off. Um, so this was a real problem for sustaining economic growth. Moreover, there were a lot of errors in these, uh, in these the issue of the, the land titles. Uh, so I had to figure out what to, to do. And the, the main reformer here, I suppose, is Sudarsono Osman. But he was a man who decided this is very much a team, got to be a team effort. And he posed a challenge. He went to the, uh, the registrars of uh, Kuching. Uh, in, in Sarawak, and he said, look, here's the challenge. You go out and you figure out how to make your registry work better. And we will use that model in other parts of Malaysia. So you'll be stars. You didn't actually put it that way, but, you, but we'll use that as a model. But you've got to figure out how to do this. And <laughs> they then rose to this, this challenge. They uh, first went out and they sat in the offices themselves and they watched how people use them and where things were getting stuck and what troubles the, the uh, clerks had in reading the forms. And they interviewed the citizens, and they interviewed the lawyers who were sometimes involved in the larger land deals, and they tried to figure out what was really going on. Uh, and once they had done that, they made some changes. They changed the forms to make them easier, faster to fill out. Uh, there had been a lot of extraneous information. They moved a lot of the junk out of the office, the files that nobody used anymore. They put those off site. Uh, they streamlined the process. You literally didn't have to walk as many paces uh, to get the job done. They put up big signs on the wall saying, here's how long it should take, and here's, here are the processes. They've made all of the, uh, the counters visible to members of the public, so members of the public could actually see what was happening. Uh, they enabled the clerks to, uh, to send cell phone messages. This is a high cell phone use country. Uh, to send cell phone messages to people telling them when their work was done. And this was really important because if anybody has been in this situation, you know, one of the real problems is that when you get backups, people come and they say, hey, where's my document? And that just adds to the backup. Uh, and so this was a, an important step that they, that they took. Uh, they had to do a number of things to um, make these revisions or these, these changes work. And a lot of these were kinds of personnel issues. They didn't lay off lots of people. And that's important to know if, um, because that's a sticky point in many parts of the world. Uh, but they did motivate them differently. They realized there were status distinctions that were impeding conversation and impeding good ideas from coming forward. And so they started to organize sporting events that brought people together in different ways. Uh, they said, we're going to hold uh, retreats to get everybody together so they can share ideas. They implemented a Japanese system of uh, sort of cleaning up the office and other things. I always forget the name of this. Uh, and uh, as, as they did this, uh, the, the esprit uh, developed uh, further. 
so that within about a year, they had uh, about 100 or close to 100 percent single day registration. They'd eliminated the backlog. And they were used as a model for other areas. So this area, this uh, the system spread. Very, very pronounced results. They won a prize. They also offered uh, some of their, their uh, employees prizes as well. So there are some very distinctive features to this, but it was an, an impressive effort. And I think it's a good example of one of these single agency transformations that I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, a, a great way to, and this mattered to people a lot. Uh, it's not something you use every day, but it, mat it was very visible. It mattered to people in this period of high economic uh, growth. So we decided, all right, what, here are some, we pulled out the characteristics that were present in this case. And we said, let's look at some other similar cases around the globe, uh, where you have a service that is delivered at only a few points, doesn't require enormous amounts of judgment or discretion. Uh, so it's a pretty simple principal agent problem to solve. And let's see what these others did as well. And I, this is not the full set, but it just gives you an idea of how we were analyzing this. Uh, so South Africa Im improved its passport issue process in a very famous uh, case. Uh, Jordan did the same a little earlier, and I know some of you looked at the Jordan case. Uh, it, they did this on their own, no consultants in the wings here. There was a consultant in the wings here. This is Cyril Ramaphosa and Ralph Meyer, architects of the transition, were partly involved in this one. Uh, the Georgia Land Registry uh, on, took some slightly different approaches. I can talk a little bit about that uh, under Jaja Bunizzi. Um, Sarah, a slightly different form because not everybody is going to be involved in overseeing this all the time. But the Bumbuna Electrical Grid and Sierra Leone had shared some of these characteristics, as did the reform of the Liberia port uh, before it was, you know, they had to get it in shape before they could uh, invite a private uh, company in to help manage. And we have a lot of these cases. And we found that they were all doing some things that looked torn straight out of a consultant's playbook. Um, they were all tracing the delivery process. They were actually getting out there on the ground and looking at what was working and what was not. And one of the big distinctions between the successful reformers and the unsuccessful is the successful ones do this. There may be cultural problems here in some settings. This is interesting. Context matters here. But the people who succeed do this. They streamlined the procedures. They uh, created some standard operating procedures so members of the public knew what to expect. And so it was easier if there was a change in personnel uh, to transfer that. They set targets. They monitored in simple ways, often just little audits or pieces of paper stuck up on the wall. They made the results visible to employees. Because one of the things they wanted to do was to mobilize social pressures. They didn't want to single out individuals for performance. And there was no meritocratic system in place in many of these instances. But you had to reward good performance. They rewarded teams that did well. Um, and they rewarded them with prizes and, and, uh, and maybe just the charts stuck up on the walls. So I'm going to skip over this one. They also varied in a couple of ways. There are some other bells and whistles, some other things that some of these successful reformers did that others didn't do, um, the other successful reformers didn't do. Uh, and so we'll just skip over these. Um, so what happens when you shift the context here? If we, we, been trying to sort out how context begins to influence this. And I'll just focus on one or two of these since time is at a premium. Um, the ability to trace the delivery chain. Well, it's not always culturally acceptable for somebody to go out and actually hold a stopwatch or at, actually uh, observe people at work. These may be patronage appointments. They may be linked to some minister. You know, it's a little dicey to say, well, now, you know, did you take five minutes longer or whatever? Um, and, and so there had to be some cultural acceptability, a pretext for this. And the successful reformers had some way to create that pretext or to get some collective involvement that made resistance um, unacceptable. Um, the, if there were unions, this could pose some problems, but often the successful uh, reformers brought those unions in from the get-go. They brought them in instantly and had them design the reform process in order to get them on board. And, and in most cases, the unions were really quite willing to do this. The more difficult ones 
Are we a, a broker behind the scene actually controlling who's employed and who's not in the organization? Uh, recognizing performance, I alluded to this, uh, in most of the environments in which we work, it's not okay to, to single out individuals, but it is to single out small groups and to try to get those groups to uh, pressure one another's members to actually perform. Uh, but this can be impeded by status divisions, racial divisions, a number of things. And the successful reformers have to come to grips with these. They have to get workarounds when these kinds of problems exist. Uh, a big politics the issue, whether it's a unitary or federal system, so we've been working partly uh, uh, with the World Bank on some case studies in Brazil, a federal system. If uh, there's a different party in power at the municipal level as opposed to the state or the, uh, the federal level, you can get some real obstacles. The question is how do you negotiate the coalition to get that reform through? And how do you sustain it through alternations of parties in power? Uh, did I, 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 I somehow, I'm, I'm going to the wrong ones here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this didn't always completely stick. Um, one of the contextual factors that matters here are employee opportunity costs. So what happens when you streamline a process and you try to get this organization to work more effectively, reduce the levels of corruption, if corruption is the problem, or reduce delay, is somebody on the line is not doing as well as they once had done. They may not be able to collect that little extra rent or, or whatever it is that they're collecting, or they may not be able to take a long lunch hour or something like that. Now, in some environments, that doesn't matter so much because the, they say, well, you know, I value this job. It's a, a pretty big um, a component of, of what I do. In other instances, uh, that may be less true. So in one environment which we've been working, it's doing this again. Um, in, in one place we've been working, uh, there are, um, there's a term daylighting. It's kind of like moonlighting, except it's during the day. And because people felt the government was likely to fall at any given time and the economy was unstable, that daylighting job was a social security. So it's harder to make this work in some environments than others. In the Republic of Georgia, they began to see some slippage from a pretty tough system they put in place for regulating behavior in the registry. Uh, and they found that people were slipping in phone cards as a kind of bribe in, and transacting business on the stairwells. That has now, I think, um, actually improved again. They, that has stopped. But it, it, a lot depends on the past. Uh, what, was, what was the expectation in the past? What kinds of pressures do your relatives put on you? Uh, and what share of your income is coming from the rents as opposed to the salary. So these are things I think uh, reformers want to consider when they think about designing one of these kinds of uh, interventions. Um, so I'm going to leave, I'm going to bridge to Nadine here because there are some contexts that I think are really challenging for this. Almost all the examples that I put up there have an urban component to them. That is, they're distributed mainly in urban areas. If you're in an urban area, you've got lots of people, densely populated, pretty dependent on whatever it, the service is, most likely. But it's also, they have a, there's a focal point. You can reach a lot of people really fast. You can use them to monitor what's going on. Far harder to do that in a rural area. Um, so I think rural areas are tougher for this kind of big results fast. Um, federal systems, uh, where you've got uh, different parties in control, tougher. Um, where you don't have a senior leader engaged, um, I think you could have problems, not always, but uh, it may be that if you have to solve a coordination problem with another uh, part of government, this becomes very hard unless that senior leader is engaged. Uh, and, and just as a comment to Peter, we found in doing this work that we had to pay attention to cabinet level performance, and for some of you who know our program, we've, we've been doing a lot of <laughs> chronicling of, of work that has brought us into contact with AGI. Um, no clear event or incident to, to motivate these reforms. That can be an issue. There usually is an incident that creates some public demand for this. Um, status divisions uh, and brokers behind the scenes can be an issue. I think less so unions if you handle them the right way. Um, rapid rotation of personnel, and this is my bridge to Nadine. If people are only on post for six months, 
and then they're moved to another government job, whether that's because of the civil service rules or more likely because there's a broker who's getting a little premium for moving people around, uh, then it's really hard to sustain this. It usually takes about a year to do this kind of thing. And uh, this, this can be a killer. And Nadine's going to tell you about an approach that I think may help you get around some of that problem. Me? May? 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 <laughs> uh, and, yes. and maybe it's, it's completely consistent with what I've just said, but it, it is also, I think it, it also is useful in environments where the approach of these reformers is a little bit less, um, less useful. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, are you an Actually, I have given up on it, so you can turn this off, whoever is in charge of this. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, for the tee-up on the rapid, since rapid results, rapid, uh, rapid reassignment. And thank you, Matt, for both the book and for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Uh, very useful conversation this morning uh, and uh, early afternoon. and. Uh, I will tell you about the rapid results work that I've been involved in, and in doing that, I may take some issue with some of the things that were said this morning, so we'll hopefully have a conversation about that as well. It's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the spirit of Matt's uh, book, I want to start with the articulation of the problem we, or I was trying to solve um, many years ago. And I say I was trying to solve because problems, as Matt teaches us, have a way of morphing and evolving and emerging. And so the problem has actually shifted quite a bit as we did this work. So about 16 years ago, I was involved in a change effort internally in the World Bank. So this is, for, for Nick and, and Michael, this is the Preston years. This is pre Wilkinson. Yeah. Way back when, he, he actually passed away on the job before the change was completed. Of course, the change <laughs> continues, as, you, as, as we all know, at the World Bank. Uh, I'm not going to make any predictions about the current change effort. Uh, in any case, the, this was internal to the bank, but one of the things that really intrigued me in talking to uh, people who are involved in operations was the problem that uh, there was often big, really, really well thought through, well designed programs and projects. Uh, but more often than not, people were frustrated that there's really no traction on the ground. The, kind of the bridge that Peter was talking about between um, <coughs> these large visions and the actual delivery and implementation wasn't always what people had hoped for. And I think truly everybody that I've worked with and at, at, at the World Bank and other development agencies, I mean, they really want these things to happen. And now we're not talking about like the big dams that shouldn't happen. We're not talking about the structural uh, adjustment issues that are controversial. I mean, we're even talking about you know, HIV AIDS prevention programs. We're talking about education, etc. So the problem as I saw it is, um, you know, why is this the case, and can, can one do something to create this traction that leads to implementation? I think somebody this morning mentioned the idea of looking at other sectors to see if similar problems have been encountered in the past. Right? Uh, so I sort of saw a little bit of the same dynamics play out in a lot of corporate efforts, where you have the CEO, maybe with the leadership team, uh, come up sometimes with help from, you know, uh, big time consultants, uh, some of whom probably graduated from the school across the river that shall not be named. Um, you know, come up with the you know phenomenal and phenomenally good strategies and programs, and then you get frustrated because there's no traction when it comes to actually implementing these and achieving the desired results. So it was a bit of a parallel problem. In fact, in the, in the early 90s, some of the big change gurus coined a term that some of you may be familiar with, uh, BHAG. Is anybody familiar with the term? Big, hairy, uh, yeah. big, hairy, audacious, audacious goal. <laughs> so every CEO was supposed to have their BHAG and 
It's a bit of a sexism thing, you know, about the hairy part, by the way. It, was, it didn't seem to be an issue at the time. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so you see Ozmeet and, you know, what's your BHAG? And then in the back of the minds, is your BHAG bigger than mine or my BHAG? Some of that going on. Now, where that the BHAGs landed in the organizations was slightly different. There was a lot of rolled eyes, right? And, in fact, they coined a different term in the front lines. Some of you may be familiar with it. You played on the BHAG where they call it Bohiga. And it stands for bend over, here it comes again. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I'd seen a little bit of that dynamic play out. And um, one of the things that we knew could work in these circumstances to maybe change the dynamics, not necessarily to solve the whole problem, but kind of to change the, to change the narrative in the hierarchy uh, was to do something um, reminiscent of what we heard this morning from Professor Fukuyama. Uh, I would call it uh, extreme autonomy. So uh, what we have seen is when the leadership creates a framework to guide the thinking and the innovation, and then create a space for extreme autonomy at the front lines, and then let the people that are closest to the work actually begin to think through for themselves where they want to go within that framework and what goals to set and what solutions to come up with. Uh, sometimes magic happens that begins to change that whole dynamic of how the organization is dealing with these you know, big, audacious goals. So, um, so I began a bit of a crusade, if I may use another politically charged word, um, to uh, introduce this idea among people at the World Bank, at the front lines, mainly team leaders. So I inserted myself in uh, training workshops where they were being, you know, talking about change, etc., and it you know, planted the seed of this idea of what we began to refer to as rapid results. Like, maybe you need to borrow from this thing that we know about change in the corporate sector related to you know, helping leaders that you're working with create that space for local innovation to happen. And we sort of landed on the idea of 100 days, because you also want, as I think we saw earlier, uh, you, you want to see some momentum building. It's, I, I was thinking, Peter, when you were describing the 150 days, and then finally in the last 60 days something happened. Maybe it was, it was a 60-day plan. Because you know, the first 90 days would have uh, would have gone much faster. Uh, so we landed on different ways to think about this notion of uh, you know how to create that space, right? Uh, of course, at the World Bank, and rightly so, people were excited about this when they heard it, the team leaders. And I don't know if Nick and, and Mike, you weren't in any of these workshops, I think, where we talked about this topic. No, that was clearly our, our problem. I, I, I was going to talk to you about that later. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the reaction was, we love it, we like it, but you know, there's no capacity where we're operating. You're telling us about this is my court at GE, my court here, and you know, it's it's a it's a legitimate thing to, to you know to consider. And then one team leader, uh, an Italian fellow. Uh, who managed the program in Nicaragua for agricultural productivity said, you know, I do have this project. It's, I love it, but you know, it's been three years. It's a 15-year project, and we're working on farmer productivity for 30,000 farmers, but really nothing yet has moved forward in terms of touching any farmers. And if you went into the country and asked any farmer in Nicaragua, they would not know about this project. They haven't been touched by it. But three years are happening with you know, with uh, uh, people that are hired in the, you know, in the bureaucracies that were created around this. Uh, there's a lot of training going on, etc. I mean, there is a lot of activity, but no outcomes were felt at the, you know, in, at the front lines. And he said, listen, the Minister of Agriculture is new, and he was going to pull the plug on this, so there's not much to lose. So why don't you just come out and see if we can, you know, build this in. And that's what happened, uh, I, was, uh, I went into Nicaragua with, uh, with Norman, and the, the bank did the convening that they do with everybody in the room that related to this project, and uh, got a bit of a similar reaction in the beginning from the people in charge of this. I mean, one of them, very powerful person in, in, in the country, uh, in fact, uh, when I started talking about 100 days, he said, listen, you know, you just don't get it. You know, we have 
been at this now for two years, and the past six months, by the way, uh, we've been trying to get an email system in place, and we can do it between us here in the office. So if you want a 100-day project, just get us the email system. That would be a good 100-day project. Let's talk about results, right? We were able to get over that and, and work with that leader and others to create a bit of space where a number of teams then were brought together, some of them farmers, and um, they uh, you know, set their own 100-day goals around specific themes that were critical for the sector. In Nicaragua, one of them was milk, for example, milk production. So set a goal in one municipality with you know, a dozen team members to double the production of milk. Again, using all the resources that existed already, nothing new. Uh, the, uh, the team ended up changing that goal to not doubling the production, but doubling the sale. And in fact, they tripled the sale of milk in 120 days. And there's you know, many other stories about the results in the rapid results piece that I can share with you. But I, I do want to just maybe stop at, with this story at uh, uh, something that I experienced uh, that stuck with me, even though this is maybe like 13 years ago, which is at the 100-day review, when we got together, the teams got together to talk about the results that they had achieved and what they learned. Uh, you know, obviously, these were very impressive results. Everyone was very, very happy with that. Uh, there was one team member on one of the teams, though, who was a you know, quintessential uh, Central American farmer, uh, probably in his 60s, straw hat, very tan face, but he was very, very quiet. Uh, so at one point, I turned to him and said, you know, I mean, we've heard a lot from many other people. I, maybe you can tell us what your experience with the last 100 days. And uh, he said, um, you know, I've been a farmer for about 40 years, and my father was a farmer before me. And every time the government people, and sometimes people from outside, would come to us, and sometimes they talk with me, and they will tell me what I need to do. This is the first time that somebody came and asked me what I wanted to do. So it's an interesting thing that kind of stuck with me about the dynamics that can change around these types of efforts. Now, we from Nicaragua, we uh, the word spread out, we got introduced to uh, a lot of team leaders in the uh, Africa region who introduced us to many government officials, worked with about a dozen countries in sub-Saharan Africa, introduced this way of working, again, not at the country-wide level, this is more sector, tend to be sector-specific, uh, you know, working with a permanent secretary here, a permanent secretary there. In some places, it was phenomenally successful in both achieving the results and, and sticking. In places like Kenya, for example, there is still this type of work continues. Uh, even though you know the last time uh, we introduced and trained people on this work was perhaps maybe eight years ago, but the government still uses this notion of rapid results as a way to empower and to discover the solutions at the local level. In some places, it didn't serve ten minutes. I'm good. I may have to stop early. Rapid results is so. Uh, Again, there were some places where it wasn't quite a, a phenomenal success that, that I, we've seen in, in, in others. Um, and actually, to, 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 the, to Matt's um, philosophy, the problem that we started with, in my head anyway, has been evolving. So at one point, we realized uh, like this notion of we're you know, helping bridge this gap from the big programs and projects of the World Bank shifted to people in government who had some you know, policies they wanted to drive, and they want to drive them in a different way. So in Madagascar, for example, there was a tax, local taxation policy that was um, uh, you know, put in place, and they, they needed to implement it. And we helped them use this notion of starting from the other side of the telescope, from the local level, take a very draft tax policy, get people in communes to begin to collect against their taxes, and then find out how difficult it is to implement some of the elements that are in this draft policy and use that as a way to adjust and improve the policy before ratifying it. Uh, in, in Rwanda, we helped the Minister of Education uh, 
take a, a policy that was on the books uh, to move from six year to nine year education, a six year basic, I believe, to six year primary to nine year basic. I'm not an education expert. And again, the same idea of creating the sense of urgency that worked in the case of Liberia, but orchestrating that in an empowering way, as opposed to in a, I have a goal coming from the top and you shall do it way. And so it shifted to helping local leaders implement policies and you know, the, the, the fundamental, um, the, the meta problem as I, as I began to see it as well was that uh, people's own sense of identity was part of what needed to be worked on so that they begin to feel empowered to actually take action even if they are in a government that doesn't have necessarily or public sector that doesn't have that history. So um, let me step back to some of the some of the lessons and observations around uh, this work that we've been doing for the past 10 years. Um, one observation and this gets to the maybe a point of contention, is that uh, we've experienced in most situations that there is tremendous capacity that we don't either see or give people credit for. Uh, and so one of reformulation of that challenge or the problem is to how, how to help local leaders unleash this untapped, latent capacity that exists. Uh, so three things that among others that we're, we've been working on. And, and this is, by the way, a, sort of a, a continual learning process, you know, what it takes to create, you know, help local leaders unleash this capability. And, and, and we keep sort of adjusting the, our thinking about the different elements that we can be helpful on. Uh, and I just wanna share three that, that uh, are, you know, rise to the top for me at this point anyway. One is, um, the, the power of creating a context in which people locally commit themselves to unreasonable goals. So the idea of the 100 days in part is to create some unreasonableness. But the trick is that it's not the 150 day plan of President Sirleaf. It is a 100 day goal that this team has been asked to set for itself to decide the how much, to have the full autonomy on the how much and the how, but be directed in terms of the, what is it, what is the challenge, what is the problem we're focusing on, and then rather than thinking, giving, you know, the autonomy scale, you know, has an apex in the middle, it's like what type of autonomy are we talking about, and if it's the autonomy of the how-to, the more that can be pushed down, the more empowering and inspiring it can be, because people then own the goals that they set. And the unreasonableness, in part, is because that's where the innovation comes from. I mean, that's where we, people begin to challenge some of the things they took for granted. But they <coughs> need to, I mean, they have to have agency. They need to own that. Go back to the morning conversation. So creating the context for setting unreasonable goals is something we have found to be absolutely critical for, for unleashing that you know, untapped capacity. Another. Uh, Another thing we've been working on is the idea of competition. So we used to do this work, you know, helping one team at a time, never do that anymore. Anytime we have this choreography, we have multiple teams, sometimes from different agencies, come together in the room and travel the journey together. What happens is there is something that gets unleashed when everybody is looking over each other's shoulder to see who's going to be the one at the end of the 100 days that's going to be coming up with excuses versus coming up with results, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, another part of it is that what we found is that by talking about what other people have achieved using this, this choreography, there's an implicit competition that's happening with people that came before us. A little bit of what Jerry Stern and later Jerry Stern wrote about with positive deviance, if you're familiar with that. But the positive deviance here isn't that there's a best practice that to apply, it's like, gee, they, they were able, even if it's a different sector, in, in similar circumstances, they were to, able to achieve in South Sudan some incredible results in 100 days. Why aren't we in Madagascar? Why can't, so it becomes sort of a meta form 
of course, the deviance that begins to play out again if you create the right choreography. Um, the third uh, thing that we found to be extremely helpful is coaching support. So this, kind of, you know, even sticking with something for a hundred days, is not easy. Uh, you know, it's, many things will get in the way, and people need some handholding. So one of the ways we have developed to increase the potential for traction of this work is to train people in any system we're in to provide that coaching support. And this is not expert advice. I mean, obviously they may need expert advice to do many things, but for the sticking with the plan they put for themselves for 100 days, they need more of the, uh, I heard somebody describe this as the grandma rules. Somebody that would stand behind and say, so how have you done today? Show me what you did. Wow, this is terrific. It's not, I know it sounds paternalistic, but it's not. This is about simply leaving that space for people to figure things out and just show that there is some support there. I mean, it's not the type of coaching that you would, I mean, nothing you learn at the Kennedy School is, you know, I mean, that stuff is very useful from a technical expertise advice. You can do that coaching without that, is what I'm suggesting. So these are the three, three of the things we keep thinking about when it comes to evolving this work. Now, I was going to tell two more short stories. How much time do I have? Uh, none. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a perfect place to stop. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Well, we have, thank you very much. We have um, 40 minutes for uh, discussion, and I understand that a mic will be going. We actually don't need the mic because as long as people just speak loudly when you ask your question, we should be fine. Thank you. All right, so everyone should self amplify and. Uh, and we'll take one question at a time, and then we'll take it back to the panel. So we'll start up here. And please identify yourself. Uh, Art Goldsmith again. Um, I have a very brief question for all the panelists. Um, I thought the, the strategy that was being that, that's being uh, uh, recommended is a very uh, plausible and, and excellent one, which is uh, basically uh, picking some low-hanging fruit, having some uh, dem demonstrable success, and then using that to build for the future. But my question for everyone is, what happens in the second 100 days? I mean, right, what? Mostly to me. No, well, maybe 150 days. <laughs> 150 more, days. Uh, but I mean, it's, you know, most development pro problems, I think, are long term. We heard this morning there are 400 years uh, that, that might be required to solve many of these things. And so, great first step, you know, have a rapid uh, success, demonstrate that to others. But where do you go? in that second hundred days and third hundred days. Uh, okay, um, sure. So it's a great question. Um, and we talked about this quite a lot actually about um, why wow, wow it's great. They do lots of things in the first hundred and fifty days and then we just sort of regress back to bad habits. I think the idea, the sort of hope, the hypothesis is that um, if you do a process like this a bit successfully the way we did it, and there are lots of differences about what we were trying to do the kind of constituency we were working with compared to what the kind of thing the Dean was talking about, working very much within government, trying to uh, strengthen, strengthen some processes. I think our, our aim was to think, well, if we're, we're trying to take a series of sort of muscles and kind of take them to the gym for a workout, um, and if those can be strengthened a little bit through the process of doing and successfully doing that kind of first 150 days, some of those capabilities might stick a little bit. Um, some of the sort of meetings that needed to happen could be transitioned into a different kind of stock-taking planning meeting. Um, and some of the sort of momentum and energy, and like, wow, that worked really well, and carry over into more sustainable, sort of transition into some more sustainable cycles or rhythms. And so, I mean, ideally, the whole second term of the present could be broken down into a series of 150 days, or a series of 175 days, or. 99 or 100. 100, 100 yeah. If you like the 100, I like that. Um, but uh, now in practice, th there, is a, there is a lapse. You know, you let yourself go. Like you do the first, like January 1st, you go to the gym for two months and then it's sort of, and, uh, you know, just And uh, it's a, you know, a little bit similar. But it, some of it sticks, and that's the hope is that you can transition some of the processes that you've built for that specific thing into some, a slightly more sustainable version. And so do, rather than weekly steering committee meetings, turn it into 
a monthly stock take of some key priorities, um, sort of maintain that, uh, that trajectory. And hopefully, as well, through doing those 150 days, you can signal, it can be a little bit like a kind of stock cube for the whole next five years. It's like a little concentrated version of the next five years. You can signal what the important things are, signal those five priorities, and then those can kind of get, you can't add water and bump them, you know what I mean, sort of increase them up to a five-year version, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, if I may add, perhaps, uh, I'm going to try a little bit. Uh, I like very much the idea of, or the, 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 the image of you know, building muscles, because that's what we're, I think, talking about here. But there's diff building muscles at different levels. So uh, one of the things that we found is critical for the sustaining of this mental attitude, as well as the type of results, is building a different type of muscle at the leader, local leadership level. Because it's, let's face it, part of the reason we get away with that, uh, with the extreme autonomy, is because it's 100 days, right? Because that's a loss, a loss of control for uh, you know folks at the you know permanent secretary level, um, and, and so getting them used to the idea that that perceived loss of control is actually not a bad thing, but it's a way for you to plant your flag on some really important results becomes sort of, you know, a part of the way to uh, increase the odds of sustainability. It, it's not, it's, I don't think we've cracked the code on how to make it happen in a consistent way. Um, the other is, again, creating that local coaching capacity that's from within the local setup, sometimes from within government that can make it their job to provide the type of hand-holding we're talking about. And just on the leadership piece, um, one example of the, the aha moment that can happen that you can build on. I mean, it's not evident that it always leads to great things, but in Kenya, uh, the permanent secretary for water, um, when he saw the presentations that his teams did about the results they achieved in 100 days, he paused and then he said, um, I really want to congratulate you, but I'm really, really frustrated. And so everybody was shocked, you know, in Kenya, that's from his section. He says, can somebody in this room tell me if these teams achieved these results in the last 100 days, what the hell have we been doing for the past 10 years? And it becomes sort of a transformational moment. And, and the Ministry of Health in Kenya is an example of where this has stuck. But there's no formula. Um, just three quick things. Um, I think absolutely the question is how do you sustain the energy and the, and the pattern of trying to get things done. Uh, and one thing that one could do is to try to make the, to, to try to build self-reinforcing incentives. So very often what happens is that uh, the, the more effective reformers will make sure that the press is involved from the, the start and that the politicians who you know, may have been helpful maybe some more so than others, do get some reward for this. They're in the picture, um, and they're in the photograph, and, and some of these reformers will actually recede into the background and put the <coughs> politician out there, so they change the dynamic a lot. Um, it, and then, then I think scaling up the competition or scaling it down, I do think you get a lot more success at the local level often than you do at the, at the national levels, but getting competition between cities uh, within a country. So my citizens in, in my city say, hey, uh, look over there at that city, they're doing, they have better roads, whatever, and developing that kind of ethic is good. Um, I'm gonna tell a quick Nadim story because in the work that Rapid Results did in Madagascar, uh, people got so enthusiastic, and admittedly it was about tax collection early on. <laughs> That's kind of hard to get enthusiastic about, but, uh, but it spread. It spread to lots of different era, different spheres of activity. It spread into the NGOs, it spread into the private sector, and then there was a term for it that I now forget. And I, yeah, yeah it, it got, and then people started saying, well, they people called it their own thing, yeah. yeah. that was their own thing, their own invention. So I think that is, <coughs> that's the kind of thing you'd like to see. Obviously there are some much tougher problems that a reformer faces, and we were only, I was just giving you a little bit of a picture of what we were doing, but a lot of these are governance traps that are much harder to tackle than, um, than these essentially principal agent management uh, problems, um, although they may be confounded by these. The, and, and that, I think, is what they're trying to buy time to do, really. They're trying to use the, the, 
These, yeah, these build the credibility so you can get to the really hard stuff and Absolutely. get the public uh, on your side. And, and that was Idris Jallo's aim, I think, very explicitly. If I may correct one thing, yeah. correct me if it's wrong word. You said pick the low hanging fruit and go after it. That's not at least the point in what we try and put forward. You actually start by focusing on the toughest problem and make progress on it in 100 days. Because you want to deal with the real issues, not just do the, you know, let's paint the building white. All right, so a question in the back. Yes, over here. Yes. My name is Gideon again. Uh, from the 100 days project, um, you are talking much about uh, using local knowledge or initial knowledge or local content that actually help to drive the project or an enabler to achievement. Yes. What's related to the 150 day project in Liberia? We were talking about uh, moving in with the philosophy, the theory of change. Do you actually find anything like the government business, government business cycle or the way of doing business on the ground, uh, synchronizing that with your philosophy, helping you to achieve a 74% um, level of result in, in your engagement? And lastly, uh, you're talking about capacity. I'm sure 100 day and 150 day capacity building and coaching. Um, what initial assessment did you do? And are they, after the project implementation, 100 day, 150 day, have you measured a change? And what capacity have you left for sustainability? Those are two questions. <laughs> so there, there's multiple questions uh, in there. Uh, and so let me try and... Uh, I was hoping Peter would take most of them, but <laughs> uh, uh, so the, let me start with the last bit, which is how do you measure, uh, you know, how do you assess whether the capacity is there? My own view is that it's really hard to measure capacity without looking at actual performance. So the way we, I mean, our surrogate for measuring capacity rather than saying, you know, doing a survey of whether you feel more empowered or less empowered is to see, for example, whether they're, you know, they're pursuing similar results and achieving similar results as they move forward. So, is it, and, and, and there, you know, uh, we, we've seen on a spectrum from people transformed in 100 days and they're never going back to people that, you know, have to go through this multiple times before that muscle gets built to people that may be willing and ready and able to keep driving for results but unless you've engaged with the leadership in the organization to uh, you know help them you know create continue to create the space people will get frustrated that yeah I mean we're, we're doing much more work now than we were doing before we're not getting paid anymore we love the recognition etc cetera, etc cetera. but at some point, the leaders have to address some of the systemic issues. You can get a lot of mileage from simply uh, somebody saying you did a great job, which is, doesn't always happen. But at some point, the leaders need to, you know, make some structural changes in the organization for people to continue to drive towards the the, the type of results that demonstrate the capacity. But the fact that you know that you can. You, you can have a situation and, 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 and people in a setting like in Sierra Leone where, you know, for two years there's a program on HIV AIDS prevention with a strategy for using voluntary counseling and testing centers and have a thousand users in two years and then have a team that is able to generate or, or have 15,000 users in 100 days tells you there's something wrong with the equation that the capacity wasn't there. Because, I mean, nothing has changed. Not the resources, not the people. So the, so the question is, how, how do leaders keep tapping into that capacity? It's not so much you're building it. It's there. Now just you need the capacity around the coaching capacity to help leaders keep creating that space. Um, thanks for two really interesting questions. Uh, so just to go in the same order as Indeen to talk about evaluation. It's a really great question, really difficult um, to measure these things. One difference, just for some concept, is that for our project in Liberia, this 150-day plan was one part of a much broader sort of project of capacity strengthening, um, which we do subject to regular uh, evaluation. Um, and that, that evaluation 
includes sort of subjective, intangible sort of measures about what, you know what people in the institutions where we work are saying about their job and the processes and the, and the things that we're trying to change together, um, and obviously more objective measures of outcomes. I have to agree with you know with Nadine. Ultimately, um, although focusing only on outcomes can be a problem, um, you have to look at other aspects. I think you have to look at you have to ultimately focus on the outcomes, and and so in terms of 150 days. I think for, for, for me the most important evaluation is what did it actually accomplish, what did it deliver, um, and then evaluating the actual capacity building sort of payoff from it, I think we looked at as part of evaluating our, our broader project in the Ministry of State. And those are things like, um, you know, do some of the uh, meetings and the sort of regular stock takes continue, are people tracking, uh, you know, deliverables and, and sort of things which are what that unit is supposed to be doing, are they tracking them more effectively? Um, are they sort of, you know, uh, are they completing certain processes more quickly? Uh, and so on. And, you know, the indications of that were, were good, but it, but it was it was part of a broader thing, you know, part of a broader evaluation of the project. Just on the question about, um, really interesting question about were there sort of local uh, ways of doing things that, that, um, that, uh, that changed, you know, the way the process happened. I think, the thing I'd emphasize is that, um, yes, almost everything about how the 150 day plan actually happened reflected a Liberian way of doing things. Uh, just to emphasize, if I didn't emphasize it enough before, you know, really from about late November onwards, it was a Liberian, and, you know, and, and members of the government who were running with this, who were, you know, designing. We actually originally were talking about a 100 day plan, but sorry to say, it, you know, it, 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 it was Liberian. Said, yeah. it, 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 it was Liberians who made it a 150 day plan. That's a very cosmetic example. But the way it was designed, the kinds of deliverables, this was all driven by the way that they visualized and conceptualized this thing. And we'd learned, you know, in the previous year not to sort of say, no, it has to look like this, come with a prescription, and to say, you know, it's got to check these boxes. It's, well, here's an idea, here's the problem that it's a solution to, or, you know, one way of looking at it. And then once, it's up, once the idea is sort of, you know, has momentum, you can help facilitate, suggest process points or suggest, um, uh, you know, ways of doing things, a steering committee and a task force, but all of those design details were absolutely um, shaped by, you know, by, by our counterparts, not by us. This wasn't a sort of blueprint that we said, here, do it like this, you know, here. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Nick, Nick Manning with the, uh, with the World Bank. Just a, a couple of questions. <coughs> the first is just to do with the sort of, the risk of history repeating itself. And um, you know, as we know, if you think back to the Berg report in um, 1990, looking at technical assistance in Africa in the 70s and the 80s, and the essential point was that there were more technical experts in Africa provided by the development industry than there were during colonialism. Right, you know. So what we had was the sort of technical experts running all over the um, all over the continent, sort of meddling deep. Right? Part of the reaction to that was then a sort of a whole era of sort of piety and sort of holding back in some funny sense or the donor sense. Paris Accra, all that, aid has got to be on budget. If you saw anything that looked like a PIU, there was lots of tut tutty. Right? Yeah. Something shifting now, and now we're back into meddling. Yeah. Right, you know, in a sense we're we're getting back into the sort of the era of this sort of deep penetration of technical assistance right within the machine, right? And, I, I, you know, I'm sure it's in a very different way, but nevertheless, we are now, we're doing the things that we were trying to hold back on from doing as a consequence of our sort of self-criticism that arose at the, um, at the end of the 90s. So, first question is, why will we just not repeat the same problems that we, re that we found before, which was that we ended up putting people in line positions, we offered all sorts of pragmatic solutions that looked terribly sensible at the time, project by project, detail by detail, but actually undermined the institutions as much as they built them. So that, that, that's, that's the first question. <laughs> The, uh, the, the, the oh, uh, would you, oh, too many? Okay, just well, stop there. It's a big one. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And, and uh, I'm just going to, I think everyone wants to chip in on this one, so okay. I'll start with Jennifer. Uh, and and <clears throat> what I talked about was not technical assistance or, or donor driven. It was, it was, uh, we're talking about public <clears throat> servants on the ground from countries uh, taking the leap. However, I wanted to come in on this because uh, I do think there are circumstances in which having uh, some help, whether it's outside or inside, 
to manage the reform while the daily business goes on is really, uh, really important. So I noted that there was a consulting firm involved in the South African home, home affairs case, and um, it was a South African uh, distinctive, a South African firm, but it, it often does make it possible to do the daily business while reform goes ahead. And that those are the people who also have the leisure to think about gathering the data and uh, how is our experiment going and, and suggesting some tinkering. Uh, so we've been working with the bank on the, the Minas uh, case in, in Brazil, uh, looking at a one-stop shop there. And again, the, the governor of that state had said, we're going to have a reform unit. They're going to help you out to the people who are actually having to do the work every day. And I think the reform does proceed a lot more effectively or efficiently when that's possible. And in, in and I said Brazil and South Africa are not low capacity environments, but you can imagine in some some environments where a lot of your people have fled overseas during a conflict, that might be helpful. The question is how to make it as local and light footprint as possible. In in my view, and. That's your job. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not dealing with that one. Um, fantastic question, and probably the, quite, the sort of existential question that kind of um, most enduring perennial question within AGI, at least. Um, the tension between capacity building, gap filling, and the problem of actually when, you know, and every AGI advisor who starts, it's every sort of night goes to sleep and thinks, is, is anybody in the government listening? You know, it, it, and my, if I just walk away, will it all just fall apart, you know, sort of fall to pieces? And in the early days, the answer is probably yes. So some of the answer to that question, the, the goal, the, the sort of, the mantra is to focus on process and not content. And that's one, that's a starting point to avoid. So, so AGI does not supply technical advisors. We're not, you know, infrastructure experts that come and actually do, um, you know, do the, the analysis or, you know, produce content. Um, now, in practice, at least in early times, especially in, in a very low capacity uh, situations, you get dragged into content all the time. And that's just, that, you know, that is a reality. And it's a, it's a tension, a constant kind of tension that I think uh, people have to try and navigate, especially when you're within the government, you're sort of really inside. Um, sometimes you have to model things to be like, this is a, this is a sort of, you know, we talked, there's a lot of controversy around this word, best, best practice, but, you know. <laughs> and then Gar, you know, shock horror, the, you know, the, the, the you know, terrible B phrase. But, but, you know, an example of, you know, what a good, I don't know, um, stop take meeting would look like, and you can sort of model that, or what a good tracker might look like. An Excel sheet which is set up in a simple way. You know, it's not, it, it's not saying this is how you have to use it. And then it's now adapted to how you think will work. Um, so sometimes you get dragged into content, you have to try and, sort of scale that down and, drag, and sort of drag yourself out of it as time goes on, the idea being that, you know, um, you sort of do it together and then, you know, first of all you, you sort of show and then, you, and then you do it together and then you sort of edit yourself out. You have to make yourself redundant. I know that's a sort of like massive cliche in the terms of the, you know, the NGO world, but um, really try and be disciplined in, in sticking to that and not, and, you, know, not you know, being process people, not technical people, I think is, is a big part of the answer. Yeah, certainly in, in, in the work that I've been involved in, uh, the ideas for the solutions never came from a, an outsider. It's always from within the system. Now, yes, we're, we're, we're adding something into the mix. It's, it's a different type of input, and you can argue, well, maybe the technical experts thought of what they were providing as different type of input. Uh, and I think this is not about sort of an either or situation. We can go, you know, too far in either direction. And it, it's more nuanced. I mean, even in the work that we do, which is sort of philosophically against the notion that an outsider puts an idea on the table because that deprives the room from, you know, ownership. Sometimes you say, well, before we get to the table, maybe it's useful to talk to X, Y, and Z who can provide some technical expertise so you can have a more robust discussion about what you want to accomplish. So I think it's just, it's more nuanced, um, at least in my experience. Right, I'm going to take the question here, and then I'll come over here. And I, I mostly have an observation. Um, 
I'm really, really struck, Nadine, especially your presentation fits so beautifully with the panel we had earlier on agency. And what really strikes me is that, as we do with so many other ideas in development, we're recycling again. But what, what you are presenting is really some of the classic, classic ideas about motivation. Management by objectives. Chris Argerus, who is here, you know, about the distinction between internal commitment and external right. commitment. All of these things are just crucial to public management. And this connects back to what Frank was saying this morning about the demise of MPA programs. Because one of the big distinctions historically between MPA programs and MPP programs was the organizational behavior course which, having taught it for a number of years, I know the students resist it like crazy, and increasingly, even in MPA programs, it has become, at best, an elective. And yet, it is the heart of how we do effective work. And kind of connecting back to, to Nick's question and comment, uh, you mentioned the idea of coaching. And this is the thing that I find really disturbing in the diaspora and development world that there have historically been all of these efforts to try to place diaspora experts into government ministries. And they assume that just because these diasporas had some connection to the country and have some expertise, boom, they're going to be able to step right in and they're going to know how to do tech transfer and capacity building and all this kind of stuff. So again, what we're missing here is training so-called experts about the process approaches, about what it means to be a coach, about what it means to cultivate internal commitment. So I think until we can address these really micro-level issues, institutional reform is still going to be just out there. I think we need, we need both. Mm -hmm. um, and and what, what, at least the work that I've been doing maybe adds a, adds a piece to the puzzle on one end, and it's not the whole story, of course. Of course. At the same time, just maybe it reminded me your comment about some of the initial reactions I would get uh, sometimes at the World Bank when we would be, be describing what these teams accomplished. They say, well, that's all Hawthorne effect. You know, the Hawthorne effect. That yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, listen, if consistently the Hawthorne effect produces results, let's just make it into the process. <laughs> like, you know? Can I just oh, yes. sort of wholeheartedly sort of applaud? Two, things, you know, two points that, uh, that Jennifer made, um, and it, you know, it relates back to Nick's question. Absolutely, you know, AGI has learned a lot since it started, and one of those big lessons has been we started out thinking of ourselves as consultants, and really much more these days thinking of ourselves as coaches. And so that methodology is has become a you know, larger and larger part of the toolkit. Um, and then secondly, the thing about motivation, I absolutely 100% agree with you. I think we talk about incentives all the time, and incentives are not the same as motivation. Right. They're very different, and motivation is about culture, and it's about attitudes, and it's about who else is around you, and your peers. And I think that, that it's high time to really, really uh, start thinking much more systematically about motivation and the kinds of tools that, that, that drive motivation, which is, again, why uh, Nadine's work is so interesting. Right here. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Nigun again. I have a... Uh, one uh, specific question and one general. My specific question is actually to Jennifer. And she mentioned, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned on the, uh, your presentation, in terms of the you know, monitoring and for results, you mentioned rewards, which are incentives. Are you talking about non-monetary incentives? How do you deal with it within the pay scale, government pay scale, which you cannot necessarily give bonuses in some cases? And my general question is, what I heard from Nadine and in general, we are talking about here good old performance contracts. It appears to me that way. You may say maybe it's a bad word. We should no longer talk about performance contracts. But in the past, if we succeed in anything, I mean, I know that at one point at the bank, Mary Shirley declared performance contracts are a bad thing. We should no longer do it. And it, it's particularly it dropped into the wastebasket. But my question to, I mean, what you are saying is basically, basically setting targets and achieving results and then you know connecting them to if they are rewards so i mean that is if it is different why is it different if you can explain it's, it's it who's results and who's targets okay. Okay. but i mean if it is if you can explain with the results and the second question is what happened to the work for example in india with project triveti was very much involved he's now doing working on performance contracts 
So how does Prajas work fit into what you do at the moment with civil servants and all around the world? And Prajas is trying very hard to, but to literally import it, export it to Thailand and Vietnam and so on. So I know that, but he's he's accomplishing some goals as far as I know. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think in most of the cases I was talking about, the, the rewards are not monetary. Are, are, uh, yeah, it is important because it will throw off the, the wage bill a lot if, if that's the case. But in most, in most instances, they didn't have that capacity. In the Jordan case, there was a tiny fixed benef or pool that they could use to distribute uh, benefits at the end in, in the form of bonuses. And they did a little of that, and I think they, they've largely abandoned that. The, um, uh, I, th I think one of the important points to underscore is that, in a way, this is an alternative to a uh, conventional um, performance management system or public major public sector reform, because it, you can do the kinds of things I was talking about without having a, an HR system that's regularly measuring employee behavior and without having a link between the HR system and the payroll system and without having dispute resolution systems. Because once you're going to start in, uh, rewarding individuals mm -hmm. uh, with monetary with benefits, then you're into something that looks like the klutzy performance assessment systems that my university runs or that your university runs or whatever. We don't they, don't well yeah. anywhere. they don't work well anywhere. So, they, they're almost always small group rewards, and they are recognition awards, of, or your model will be used in other parts of the country, uh, or we'll, we'll have a, an event at the, the local club or something like that. It's much more small scale, and I think probably pays off a lot better. Yeah, maybe performance management is it's not a question of being a bad word. It's just a, that's not the whole story. Plus, in the case, at least, of the work we've done, uh, the issue of agency and ownership becomes key. So whose results and whose goals are these? And if there's agency around defining the unreasonable goals, they tend to have a, a sort of a self-motivating element to them. And similar to what Jennifer was saying, uh, at least in the first few cycles of this work, uh, you get tremendous performance without the promise or the delivery of monetary rewards, and you get it through peers, through recognition. Um, you know, in, in Eritrea, a team leader who was a commercial sex worker took on the team leadership of a team in the ministry, you know, among others, working on. Uh, use of female condoms among the commercial sex workers in Asmara, in downtown Asmara. And you know, she, she and her team achieved a remarkable result, 70% usage of female condoms. The Minister of Health, in a meeting with 100 people, including the religious leaders, would stand up after he hears us, hears her describe this and say, again, similar to the, uh, the fellow in, 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 in Kenya, what you and your team have done in the last 100 days for the prevention of HIV AIDS is more important than anything anybody in this room has done in the past year, including myself. I mean, that's currency. That's a sen sense of identity that that person <laughs> carries with them for a long time. Now, it, maybe it's not scalable. I mean, what we're talking about is creating pockets and islands and, and you know, it, it's within a broader sea. So I'm not suggesting that this is a Full answer. Right. So <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify um, about the comments that you made. I don't think there's any contradiction between your views and my views. Uh, it seems to me that what you're saying is that you need to incorporate, you know, that local actors have knowledge about their own situation and they're the best ones to design systems that, that affect them. And I think that's absolutely true. And from a motivation standpoint, it has you know, great effects. Uh, however, capacity is still important, because I doubt you'd want those same farmers to have autonomy in designing the procurement system for the defense ministry, like staffing the central <laughs> bank, you know, I mean, whatever. Uh, so you know, so the, the capacity is still around. But the other thing is that I think having a hierarchical structure to grant that autonomy 
uh, on a sustained basis is really important. I'll give you one example. The township and village enterprise system in China is a very, very weird institution. I don't think a lot of Westerners understand how weird it was. The Communist Party basically was telling local governments in China, not just that you go encourage private sector development, but you actually start businesses. And you can and, and violate every rule of Western public management where you say you can't appropriate the rents that you, yeah. and they said, no, you go make money and you can personally keep 60% of your profits as long as you, and, and we'll give you complete autonomy as to how you do this. You can start a casino, you can, you know, whatever you want to do, you just go do it. But you have to plow back 40% of your earnings into reinvestment. And the only reason that this didn't result in a massive, you know, rent-seeking corruption was you had this highly disciplined, kind of ideologically driven party that granted that autonomy and rode herd over those people. And that's what made it sustain. And then finally, when it got out of control, they just shut it down. So I do think that you know the sustainability part of it requires capacity at a, at a leadership level. level. Uh, absolutely, at a different uh, level of leadership. What we speak of. All right, I want to take some questions right from the back. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, my name is Dale Algosa. I work with a small shop called Reboot. It works on a very variety of governance and, and development issues, and I'm also a proud holder of an MPA degree. Um, I like hearing the, the management discussion brought into this because I think it's missing in a lot of international development discussions. Um, but what really makes um, public services unique, I think, is the public aspect of it, which is, it seems like we're, we're missing a little bit from this conversation when we think about sort of managing public servants to do work better um, and the kinds of accountabilities we put on them, sometimes is missing that aspect of the civic accountability. Um, even when we talk about newspapers and, and other journalists, there's it's still a, a somewhat elite band. And um, in this conversation, this meeting, I, I come back to this, Matt's book and his framework around adaptation, around the ability of a system to continually evolve after a, a, a short push that maybe uh, increases some short-term management practices and, and then there's sustainability with them, but how you build in those feedback loops to allow it to continue to evolve, continue to respond to those public's uh, needs in whatever form they might change into. That's what I would really love to hear from you guys because we struggle with this in our work, how to think about that. If there are examples from your work maybe outside the 100 days or the 150 days or some of the other projects that ISS have looked at of how to build those um, citizen and social accountability loops, I'd be really interested to hear some of that perspective. Um, we're actually working on this issue right now, so if you have ideas, uh, I'd, love, I'd love to hear them. So, so, so one of the things that makes me a little bit nervous about this as we've been working in this area is how short-lived most of the citizen monitoring efforts are around the globe. There are lots of them that start up, and there are not so many that are sustained. Uh, we, we profiled, and you can find us on our website, one, uh, we've profiled two of the Philippines. One is the textbook uh, monitoring system, which is partly sustained. And then uh, in the north, there is a, an area called Abra that had citizen monitoring of public works. Um, and both of those were, were fairly sustained by comparison to, to many others. But what you see in uh, both cases is that there was a pre-existing civic network uh, basically, the election monitors who said between elections, and maybe we could be useful. In the textbook case, there was a, a university to help coordinate. So you have a lot of people absorbing some of the costs of collective action there, and you don't have that in a lot of other places. Um, and in the opera area, I really think it's a couple of people and the, the church who sustained it in very difficult conditions. And, and hats off to them, but I don't know that it's a model that you can pick up in other areas as a result. So we've been trying to find sustained examples of it. How do you keep it going once you get it started? Um, and I suppose that the kind of monitoring that you get in the um, Indonesia KDP PMPM case is perhaps the more interesting, um, the more sustained, the more widespread form um, that has only been tried in uh, Indonesia in a, well, in a very small scale in a very different way in Afghanistan. Um, and so I, I would love to hear more people's examples. One other case I would mention is that, you know, talking about Bangladesh on the same line as um, great governance right now is necessarily a good idea. But they, uh, there was a, a program that DFID, I think, determined it didn't consider a success. But I find it interesting. And it's a little bit like 
uh, some of the, the rapid results work. That is, they <coughs> created groups to try to achieve 100-day goals. Uh, and then they, uh, they in deliberately invited members of civil society, the press, and the politicians in. And they tried to create a self-reinforcing incentive by uh, having the politicians sign on that this was, they, they would pledge to support this. They got a lot of credit when it happened. Uh, and I don't know whether that has been sustained at all. It fails in some places, in some sectors, and it is more sustained than others. But that was an attempt to get around very rapid promotion of, or re very rapid circulation of personnel. So I, that's my two cents on this one. Um, I think it's a really great, it's a great uh, sort of question. Um, so the, the example I gave with this Liberian media center, you know, getting involved, you know, is a perfect example of how that kind of, suddenly, you know, as I say, lit a fire under, uh, under the government to, to get moving. And I think um, our work, it's much easier to build those kind of processes if you're working at a very community level. AGI's work sort of in the presidency, it's, you know, it's hard, okay, we can encourage a sort of Palava hut, go around the country, you know, sorry, Palava huts in Liberia is a sort of tradition where you sort of get together in a, in a, a Palava hut, um, and, um, which is a sort of, a, you know, thatched hut and, uh, and uh, you know, and have a conversation. And, it certainly can encourage those sorts of processes, those sort of listening processes, but um, there are lots of organizations doing really good work in Liberia, for example, on, uh, with civil society organizations and the media to kind of improve their capability um, to, you know, to, to, to hold the government accountable. I think the, the most useful thing AGI specifically can do is to try and improve the government's ability to respond and participate in those processes. Uh, and a good example outside of 150 Days is around freedom of information. Liberia is one of the first countries in Africa to pass the Freedom of Information Act. And, you know, just you talk about capacity, uh, capacity problems, trying to respond to freedom of information requests and build some processes within institutions to make, you know, government data available, which even makes some of that community accountability uh, possible. It's the sort of lifeblood of, uh, of that accountability. There's certainly a lot of work to be done within government to create some processes and some ability, uh, both a culture of responsive and welcoming those kinds of processes. And that's why this LMC example is so great, because it, it, everybody came out of it feeling good and feeling like that was really beneficial, rather than feeling as though they're chasing us, they're kind of a, being, it being defensive. Um, and it, it, yeah, sort of building you know, both, both the culture of receptiveness to that and the capacity to actually respond and generate data and make it available. Yeah, just one example from uh, the work we've been involved in that's concrete and I think has been sustained. The, the Kenyan government actually built into the process as they kind of adopted it and adapted it, mm -hmm. the idea of what they call a political launch of each rapid results initiative, each 100-day project, where uh, literally they take out an ad in the paper in the nation, uh, you know, and this, uh, the, the ministry would say, you know, we've just convened three of our you know, rapid results uh, teams, and these are the hundred-day goals they set. And you know, watch, watch us as we you know proceed over the next hundred days uh, to see what results we're achieving. I think that they may be keeping up with it. I'm, I'm not sure this is you know I mean from a year or two ago, and again, way after we had been involved, it's something they came up with and they baked into the process. If, and if I could just say one other example, and it's a slightly different kind, Bangalore um, in India, and I think there are some others as well, but. Uh, the problem here is you have very rapid uh, turnover in personnel, and uh, the, the mayoral position rotates constantly. So the private sector was very concerned that there was no continuity and no ability to sustain reform, and they formed a, a kind of uh, report card system, but then worked out a deal. So the, uh, the heads of departments in the city once a year have to come and actually face the citizenry and the civic groups and answer questions, and uh, I think this has been enormously helpful there, and it, perhaps a model for places that have very rapid turnover of personnel or alternation of parties in power, because that transition is so rocky usually. Right. Well, uh, Peter, on the freedom of information front, I can tell you that uh, I just got told by the Department of Defense here in the United States that I'll be getting a response to a request I filed with them imminently, and I filed the request in 2003, so, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to I'm pretty sure Liberia is meeting international standards. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I think we're out of time, right? right. Uh, so unfortunately, we've had a wonderful conversation, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So would you please join me in thanking our. Uh,